Ricky Stenhouse is here. Ricky Stenhouse has joined us, everybody. Give him a round of applause for coming by here. Pole setter. Our pole setter in a Chevrolet. That's uh, right. Yeah, that sounds good, man. That, that really got me the invite to the show. That's right. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, you got it. So what is it like driving a Chevrolet? So far, so good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, they, uh, the guys brought a really fast car down here. Uh, they worked all off season on it. Um, obviously, a few of us that switched over there have a – little chip on her shoulder, something to prove. And I feel like they've, uh, they've done that so far. And uh, it drove really good in the draft. It was, it was good. We only had a, a few of us Chevy cars out there. And uh, I felt like Chase and I worked really well together. Uh, I talked to him a little bit after. He still says he feels like he needs to get his driving a little bit better. Uh, I felt like mine drove good. I was a little nervous with how much speed we had in qualifying that, you know, going into the race, like, oh, how's this thing going to drive? Because it, it did feel a little bit looser of a race car than, than what I was used to on the speedways. And But I felt like last night I could, you know, kind of maneuver wherever I needed to. You raced last night, too. I mean, nobody oh, knew yeah. what you were going to do, but, man, you oh, just yeah. stuck it in there. Yeah, I like to race. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's so hard to, you know, you want to go do well for, you know, your new partners, your new team. You want to show what you got, run up front. And, and I felt like we showed – kind of everybody in the field that, you know, we have a car that's capable of doing what we need to do. We can lead lines, we can push, I can get pushed, and, and I felt comfortable in all those situations. That's so smart, man, because if you, all right, you go out there and set on the pole, you had this concern about your car and whether it was going to be comfortable in the pack. Everyone else in the field has that same concern or assumption about your car, unless you go out there and prove otherwise. I always felt like that it was so important to be aggressive in practice in, in the qualifying races because I wanted everybody to know, like, this is a great car. Yeah. I, and if he pulls out of line, I might want to get behind it. And so – And by the way, the whole time I raced with Junior, if he was behind you and he pulled out, they always went with him. <laughs> you know just, what? Just they, so you know. Everybody says that. <laughs> and, and I, I was because of all the hard work I put in in practice. <laughs> okay. It <so laughs> makes sense. Is that why, Ricky? Is that why? Yeah, he, yeah. Something like that. He's the hardest worker. Everybody knew yeah. that, right? I'm I was there. actually late because I was going over the race. We were watching SMT, me and Ryan Priest. Just, you know, this is uh, – he's still fairly new to, to the cup side on drafting and, you know, making moves. And we were kind of looking at everything and – I think the 11 hung him out, and I was like, yeah, back in the day when Junior was buying it, you had to watch that every time. <laughs> <laughs> He'd hang you out? Well, yeah, he wanted to get to the front. I got to go Which, to the front. Like, hey, hey, you know what? This all reminds me now. Let me, cause now, it's all I wasn't, back to I wasn't in a Chevrolet when he hung me out. And that's okay, so. <laughs> because let me tell you something. You know who complained most about him hanging out? It was his teammates. Uh, yeah. Jeff Gordon, get Jeff Gordon going well, on Dale Junior's the drafted party. Well, they would have the highest expectations as anyone out there, so of course they're going to complain the most. Some of the most entertaining radio chatter ever is Talladega, just turn it on to Jeff Gordon's channel when Dale Jr. is out there he, and just let it ride. He would complain he, about at least something I did every single lap. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But if he'd let you lead, then it would be fine. Yeah, that's right. I like to lead. I know. I feel like if I always – people uh, come to me, younger drivers come to me and ask me about drafting, and I always tell them, like, the mentality that worked for me, and I didn't use it every time, uh, was if – trying to lead every lap you can't realistically lead every lap but if you're always trying to lead every lap then I think you're safer on the offense than you are if you're on the defense anytime oh, yeah. I ever tried to be defensive careful protect uh I always ended up getting crashed oh yeah, yeah. I, I I agree 100 percent. I think you know people are like oh why are you aggressive I'm like I'm aggressive because I want to keep my track position because oh, yeah. I want to stay in the front even though like lately the crashes have started like second and third row. Normally, yeah, you know, yeah. it used to, back in the day, it would start right in the middle of the pack. And now it's, you know, we're, we're blocking, we're doing this, we're doing that. And it seems like, you know, the chaos happens, you know, two or three rows back from the leader. But if you're leading, you're, you're way safer. Yeah. You're, you, bear, you, did, you did change teams, but you're able to stay with your crew chief, Brian Patty. You talked about some other guys even coming over from the team as well. Um, not uncommon for a crew chief to change from one team to another and hire some of those guys or bring some of those guys that he trusts. Uh, that's got to that's got to help you, I think, in this big change. You're, it's a huge change for you as a driver to move organizations, but it's got to give you some comfort seeing some familiar faces when you pull into the garage. Yeah, it was. I mean, to me, the the biggest thing was just this off season. You know, I was out dirt racing. Uh, you know, I was in the shop when I wasn't dirt racing. I mean, anytime I was home, I'd go to the shop, hang out with the guys, and just get to know all the new people. But it was really nice, like. You know, us drivers, I can walk around the shop and I can be like, oh, that, that looks nice. I mean, it looks like we got really good craftsmanship. I like the interior of these cars. They look nice. Seems like they got all the parts and pieces. But 
to have that reassurance from Brian Patty, who's working in the the shop every single day, and's like, man, we got the we got the parts, we got the resources, we got the people, we can run well here and and, and do good things. And uh, looking at the the jump that JTG Doherty Racing made from you know. 2018 to 2019 they built their own chassis built their own bodies uh, i think that was a step in the right direction and now uh knowing that brian patty feels like hey we got the stuff that we need to run well um you know brings brings a lot of confidence with me i gotta ask you um and and so i had never i know i've heard the name stenhouse in racing but i'd never really you you for me came out of thin air Popped on the map yeah. and became a Xfinity Series champion driving for Roush. What was your uh, career? How did you get there? What was your career like? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, so my dad raced sprint cars. He worked for a company called Racing Head Service back in the day, and that's kind of how he got into racing. He didn't start racing until he was like 22. Oh. And then, I mean, I was born, and my mom took me to the racetrack. I was six weeks old. And so I'd been going the racetrack ever since and raced BMX, rode dirt bikes with my dad, and then ended up racing go-karts when I was six years old. And so I did that till I was 15. My dad was still racing sprint cars. He was building engines. And we had a test day at a racetrack when I was 15. I went and weighed, made 10 laps, and then dad said, I'm done. He hadn't got back in a race car since. Wow. And so I ran the next week, and then I ran. That was 2003. 2006 we had a really good year running sprint cars throughout uh, like Ohio through the Midwest and 2007 February um, you know dad kind of told me hey this is gonna be like your college I'm gonna give you like three four years to race I'm gonna help race you know build engines we had great great people that you know family friends that helped us as well and he said I'm gonna give you four years and that'll be your college and then we'll figure out what to do after that <laughs> and I've so worst colleges that's yeah so 2007 beginning of that year dad's like i'm not sure how much we're gonna race and i was running silver the silver crown car i was working at a shop in memphis uh carl edwards had a little bit to do with this silver crown team and they were going to manzanita speedway we were going to race the the copper on dirt and usac had uh midgets sprint cars and silver crown there well, I talked my dad into letting me take the sprint car. I'd only ran non-wing one other time in sprint cars. And we go out there, won the sprint car race, won the silver crown race. Tony had his cars there. Casey had his cars there. And a month later, one of Tony's drivers got hurt, and they called me. Hey, do you want to come drive for Tony? I was like, heck yeah. So that's when I started driving for Tony, and that was kind of my first stint with Chevrolet. Um, that weekend, though, was your big weekend. That you weekend was it. All the big that was it. That was there. February. I that can't remember it. the exact date, but it was, in, it was 2007 in February. I ran that next season with Tony. Uh, in October of that year, I signed with Jack and raced here at Daytona in wow. February of 2008, running ARCA. Wow. I was like, it was like just one thing happened after another. So that explains why you did. Yeah. There, there was no yeah. chance for an introduction until he got here. It That's was, right. It yeah. was that quick. It was crazy. Uh, we tested uh, Lakeland, Florida. We tested somewhere else, and then we went to Kentucky, my third test in, in a stock car. I was like, dang, this is crazy. Lakeland, Florida is tough. Yeah. And then I – but I was comfortable because – I'd ran a Silver Crown race there before, so I was like, all right, I know this track. Yeah. And that year that I ran for Tony in 2007 was really the first time I started racing asphalt, too. And so that was kind of a, a big adjustment. What, what, what about Lakeland, Florida? I've never I even just, heard of that track. Well, it's gone now, but oh. just wore out slick. Yeah. Oh. It's, it's a, cool, a small, cool track. Pla yeah, was small place for a stock car. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's what happened. And then we ran ARCA 2008. Only ran seven nationwide races in 2009, and then full time 2010, 11, and 12. And when we were on, we won Rookie of the Year in 2010. We were at the banquet, and we were sitting in the crowd. And Mike Kelly was my crew chief, who is now at JTG Doherty with me. We were down there, and we're like, we're gonna sit up there on the stage next year. Like mm. that was our goal, and uh, we knew that we were going to the new style cars, and all the new style races. Uh, we ran three or four. You won here at Daytona in the new style car. I think we ran third. And, like, we were always fast with that style of car in those four races that we ran that year. And so we felt like we had a good chance to to win the championship, and, and we did. 
So we hear about uh, Christopher Bell and Kyle Larson running dirt. You, st uh, you still race dirt. Uh, you have an o your own team. Uh, talk to me about that. Tell me I, – I pretend like I know nothing about it. <laughs> Tell me about your team, where your team runs, when you drive, why do you drive. Give me all the background on that. All the background. Well, so – up and through 2012, I ran probably 25, 30 sprint car races a year, you know, between midget and sprint cars. And then 2013, Jack was like, hey, you're running cup. Let's not do any of that. <laughs> so I didn't run it for 13, 14, 15. And 16, I was like, Jack, those few years are up. I'm going to race sprint cars. So uh, I started dabbling back into sprint cars. I still ran midgets in the off season. And starting to try and get my schedule built up a little bit more to run to run more races. But our team's based out of Brownsburg, Indiana, kind of more centrally located. You know, our guys, we race 90 races a year oh, is on the schedule. Those sprint car guys do and schedules. So, you, you'll never complain about your life yeah, when you hear a sprint car I mean, car they're up schedule. and down the road. And I really like their, the shop to be based in Charlotte so I could go to it, work on the cars, hang out with the guys. But realistically, it doesn't yeah. make sense. They're gone. Uh, sometimes I think Casey's guys are gone two or three months at a time. And mm -hmm. If I got the shop in Brownsburg, they're able to kind of get through there. But, you know, the sprint cars, I grew up racing them. I felt like that's kind of what helped me learn how to how to race and, you know, maneuver a car around, change lines. You know, the track's always changing, and they're just really fun to watch. And so they weigh 1,400 pounds with the driver, have close to 900 horsepower, and it's just a – sometimes you feel like you're holding on, but – Oh, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so – what it looks um, like. I got great partners with Noss Energy Drink that have tied into the cup side, tied into my career, and then also helped me on the dirt side. And they, they do a lot in dirt racing across all, all series. And uh, it's just a, a fun thing to do. It gives me something to do on the weekends at night. I mean, Larson and I will get together and, and watch our sprint car teams race uh, across the country every night on, online and gives us something to do. How many races will you run a year? Uh, I think this year – I ran six races this off season. Uh, this the, throughout the season, I'll probably run ten to twelve. Yeah. Well, yeah. First off weekend, I uh, got a double header USAC midget race uh, back at my home track, so I'm gonna go do that. Nice. You know, that's the thing about these guys. I've I've learned because um, how many years did you go without running sprint cars? Because three. Jack, so when, it's like the, these sprint cars guys. If you take sprint car racing out of a sprint car guy's, you know, of schedule, it's like you've amputated them. Yeah. You know, yeah, and it's it like, felt like that. The next time they have a contract negotiation, you better bet <laughs> they are going to make sure that's in it, right? I mean, yeah. So like Jack was always good at letting me just kind of do what I wanted, but then, you know, he wanted to focus on Cup, and so I did that for a year, and then uh, Tony got hurt, Leffler, yeah. you know, had his crash. Yeah. Uh, my buddy Brian had his crash, and then it just kind of delayed everything uh, a little bit longer for me. But all in all, I mean, you, you can't take sprint car racing away from somebody that sprint car raced. I mean, we, we love it. It's, uh, it's who we are. It's, you know, kind of what got us here. And we want to give back. I mean, Sheldon Hoddenshield that, that runs our car, he's 24 years old. His dad raced. It was a legend in, in World of Outlaws sprint car racing. And it's cool to be able to give an opportunity back to somebody else. Yeah, that's definitely a recognizable last name. All right, buddy. Well, we appreciate you coming out here, giving us some of your time. I know that you got a busy week, and uh, we really, really thank you for for being here. Absolutely. Everybody, give him a round of applause. No thank you, Ricky. Our pole sitter. He'll be the show on Sunday. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're gonna put on a show. That's right. <laughs>